contradicting statements from top health experts in China about the virus situation in Beijing, is it really under control? China is trying to lead the world in the virus vaccine race, announcing new developments. But it's been plagued with faulty vaccine scandals for the past decade. One victim's mom tells us why she doesn't trust vaccines coming from China. In order to advertise that there's plenty of food in China, the state-run media claims a big harvest from a village in central China, which locals from the area say they don't believe. Russia weighing in on the conflict at the India-China border. Local Russian media reports Moscow has pledged support to India. And U.S. federal prosecutors accuse a Chinese firm of selling thousands of defective masks to the U.S., which could pose a threat to frontline healthcare workers. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Many are wondering whether or not the CCP virus situation in Beijing is under control. But Chinese officials have given two different answers in the span of two days. On Thursday, the chief epidemiologist at China CDC said the virus outbreak is under control in Beijing. But on Friday, an anonymous expert from China's health committee told a local media outlet that it's too early to make a judgment. He explained that a determination should take several factors into account, not just the number of confirmed cases. One factor is whether the confirmed cases were diagnosed after being quarantined or after going to the hospital on their own initiative. The latter means a much higher risk of patients infecting others. In that case, the situation cannot be considered under control. The expert added that at the beginning of Beijing's second outbreak, patient information was made public. That includes data like when patients first noticed their symptoms, when they went to the hospital, and any places they had recently been to. But now very little patient information is made public. Due to the lack of information and how infectious the virus is, the expert says it is difficult to judge the situation. Now to Beijing's hospitals. One hospital with over 1,600 staff members is now closed. That's because, according to state-run media, a nurse there was confirmed to be infected with the virus. Last week, we reported that locusts have emerged in northeastern China. Despite theories that they may have come from elsewhere, they were found to have originated in that area. Now, the invasive insects have appeared in two more provinces in central China. At the same time, India and Pakistan are fighting desert locust swarms. Speculation is rising if these locusts could migrate to China. But it's considered difficult for them to cross the Tibetan Plateau due to the area's low temperatures. The only other possible routes would take them through southern or northwestern China. Food supplies in China are in crisis amid the impact of the CCP virus pandemic. Yet China state media reports bumper harvests this year. But Chinese netizens post messages telling different stories. A report published by Chinese state media shows wheat production in the central province of Henan breaks the national record, yielding over 11,000 pounds an acre. A bumper crop of grain is good news for a country with a large population, but none of the Henan netizens in the comment area seem to believe it. Many say a drought hit Henan this year, which combined with the effects of the spring frost mean a production of around about 5,000 pounds an acre is considered good. Some got less than half of that. According to China's National Bureau of Statistics, the average yield of wheat in China is less than 7,000 pounds per acre. China is the world's biggest consumer of wheat, which Chinese people use to make noodles, dumplings, buns, and other staple foods. China has been racing to get ahead in the vaccine development for the CCP virus, but its pharmaceutical industry has been plagued with vaccine scandals. A victim's mom tells us why she doesn't trust vaccines made in China. NTD's Juliet Song has the story. China has been racing to develop a vaccine for the CCP virus. Now five Chinese companies are conducting human trials, with one claiming that it could conclude the final testing phase as early as this fall. But for the past decade, China's pharmaceutical industry has been plagued with scandals of faulty vaccines, calling into question its product safety. A mother posted on social media saying, even if the Chinese vaccine was ready to go, I wouldn't dare to get injected. Her son was injected with a faulty vaccine when he was three months old. Before the injection, he was a healthy baby. 
About 12 days after he was injected with the vaccine, he lost his speech, he lost his voice, he couldn't move, and he couldn't even raise his head. Now her son is 12 years old, but still can't speak and is unable to attend school. In China, vaccine scandals are nothing new. From 2007 to 2018, at least 13 major manufacturers were found to produce faulty vaccines, causing severe side effects. This includes one of the companies currently developing CCP virus vaccines, the Wuhan Institute of Biological Products. The vaccine given to Yang's son is from another company, but they're both under the same medical group, Sinopharm. It's the largest state-owned pharmaceutical group in China. It's unclear how many children have fallen victim to faulty vaccines in China, but a 2013 documentary recorded 100 children harmed by vaccines. They were paralyzed, became mentally disabled, or in a vegetative state. Yang tried to seek justice for her son, but to no avail. She tried to get her son into education, but no school in her area would take him. My child is now already 12 years old. He didn't get to enjoy a single day of school. She went to her local authorities to appeal for help. Guards wouldn't let her in. She said disabled children like her son should enjoy an annual government aid of over $3,000. But she never got the money. Yang said life is too difficult. I have to make money and bring my child to see a doctor in different parts of the country and also have to take insults from other people. I really feel it's been too hard. Too hard. In China, it's often difficult to defend one's rights through the legal system. Yang took to popular social media platform Weibo to seek help. But the platform shut down all of the eight accounts she opened. <laughs> Yang is filled with resentment towards the Chinese authorities. She said they don't deserve to be the leaders of the country. Reporting by Wang Jing and Juliet Song, NTD News. As tensions continue to rise between China and India, other world powers are weighing in. Russia now has pledged support to India. According to local Russian media, top sources have said the country stands behind India and supports its efforts to resolve the border conflict. The news comes after Russian spokesman Dmitry Peskov told reporters this week that Russia is closely monitoring the China-India border standoff. He called the situation there very alarming, adding Russia hopes the two nations can resolve the conflict on their own. He also emphasized that China and India are both partners and allies to Russia. Russia and India have a history of close ties. This year alone, Putin and Modi have spoken several times in regards to the pandemic. Foreign ministers from both countries are set to meet via video conference next week. Meanwhile, on the front line, tensions have boiled over at the India-China border. 20 Indian soldiers died and more than 70 were injured as violence broke out this week. China has not yet said whether or not it sustained casualties. It stands as the worst conflict between the two countries in 45 years. Ten Indian soldiers were reportedly captured and detained by Chinese troops Thursday night, something China denies. Now both sides are blaming one another for starting the fight. India is calling the conflict a premeditated and planned action by China. That's as China's foreign ministry spokesman says the responsibility lies entirely with the Indian side. Despite the blame game, the two sides are still hoping for diplomatic resolution and de-escalation of the conflict. On Wednesday, U.S. federal prosecutors accused the China-based Crawford Technology Group of selling 140,000 defective face masks to a U.S. distributor. Crawford claimed the masks are KN95 grade and can filter out 95 percent of harmful airborne particles. But testing shows that on average, the filter only about 20 percent. Before May, the company produced accessories for mobile devices, but no medical gear. KN95 masks are used by healthcare workers to battle the CCP virus. Defective masks can put wearers at risk. China has come under fire for exporting defective medical gear amid the pandemic, but it appears that's not all that the country has been sending out. U.S. Customs and Border Protection officials seized a shipment containing 25 fake Apple AirPods from China at the beginning of the month. They were listed with a retail price of nearly 4000 Customs officials say that the earbuds' poor quality packaging is what tipped them off. 
In a statement, they said, quote, the parcel was manifested as lithium iron batteries, adding that officers noticed during an inspection that the quality of the packaging and marking on the items were not consistent with the quality of a legitimate product. The fake products have since been destroyed. According to a report, Customs and Border Patrol seized over $4 million worth of goods in a typical day last year. Nearly 90 percent of the knockoffs come from China. According to a Swiss lender, UBS, three quarters of manufacturers in China plan to move at least part of their production out of the country. Besides U.S. firms, 85 percent of North Asian firms also have plans to leave. Even three out of every five Chinese manufacturers want to do the same. That could mean up to 30 percent of China's exports, or 750 billion U.S. dollars, might be relocated. Around nine out of ten healthcare companies have already started or are about to start moving. The pandemic highlights the vulnerability of global supply chains. While the Chinese regime's response has shown companies that it's risky to concentrate production in China, Japan, Vietnam, and the U.S. could be the biggest beneficiaries of the production shift. China has rolled out a new program, the widespread collection of blood samples. Blood samples from men and boys across the country are now being gathered. According to documents seen by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and the New York Times, China's plan is to create genetic maps for 700 million men. And it's not a new idea. Chinese police have reportedly been collecting samples since late 2017. It now has enough to build the world's biggest DNA database. That kind of database would allow authorities to trace a man's relatives through blood, saliva, or any other genetic material. That kind of database would allow authorities to trace a man's relatives through blood, saliva, and any other genetic material. Chinese police are utilizing tests made by U.S.-based Thermo Fisher Scientific to collect the samples. Some U.S. lawmakers have criticized the firm for working with the Chinese regime. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute also released a lengthy report voicing concern over the widespread DNA testing. The report points out that the Chinese regime is taking samples from tens of millions of people with no criminal records, and most of the time without their consent. Outside China, DNA sampling is usually reserved for criminals, so as to build up a criminal DNA database. But that's not the case with China. The report also notes China's history of taking DNA samples from ethnic minorities like in Tibet and Xinjiang back in 2013 and 2016. The regime conducted these tests in the name of free health checks. But the report calls these large-scale collections a violation of domestic and global human rights law. That's because the Chinese regime can use these records to track ethnic minorities and other target groups, thus gaining genetic control of the population. Australia has been the victim of a series of cyber attacks in recent months. Three government sources say Australia views China as the main suspect. Prime Minister Scott Morrison says Australia knows it's a state-based actor due to the scale and nature of the strikes. The attacks were directed at all levels of government, including political bodies, essential service providers and critical infrastructure. Australian intelligence also noticed similarities between the recent attacks and a cyber attack on parliament from a year before. Last year, Australia concluded China was responsible for it, but didn't make a public statement. This Saturday, here on this channel, we bring you a special report on how the Chinese regime is manipulating America. What are the risks of this invisible ideological war? And what does it mean for Americans? Tune in at 9 p.m. on Saturday to find out. No bombs, no bullets. This is an invisible war. And they've developed ways to manipulate all of us. And this is all infiltration, subversion to control the narrative. To shape your opponent's perceptions of you. Our God-given rights are being silently eroded, yet we are completely unaware. Sending an official letter urging that an American elected official shouldn't exercise his right to freedom of speech. Make certain media outlets think twice about reporting certain issues or certain topics. The provost of the university personally called me out and escorted me off campus, telling me not to return. An unnoticed dark force is attacking America. Then it's a struggle between freedom and totalitarianism.
Former Occupy student leaders Joshua Wong and Nathan Law said on Friday they plan to enter primaries for Hong Kong's Legislative Council elections. Today I announced to run for office in the upcoming Legislative Council election in the district of Kowloon East. The announcement was made despite facing disqualification under the impending national security law. Last month, China's legislature approved a proposal to impose the national security law on Hong Kong. Critics say it threatens fundamental political freedoms and civil liberties in the semi-autonomous territory. And in Hong Kong, the owner of a children's clothing shop says he won't remove a statue symbolizing the city's recent protests. He says he wants to teach children about democracy. She's led the pro-democracy demonstrations from on top of Hong Kong's Lion Rock and been used in protests on the street. Now, the statue, dubbed Lady Liberty, is in a kid's clothing store called Chicky Duck. But the shop's owner, Herbert Chow, is facing a request from his landlord to remove her, citing a contract clause that says all decorations need to be approved. I'll continue to say what I want to say. I'll continue to speak up. And if speaking up for democracy and against tyranny gets me arrested, then I guess I'll be arrested. The owner wants to include the statue in his shop to teach children about democracy and says he is not violating his lease agreement. Our customers from the age of 4 to 11 would have an opportunity to actually start thinking about the subject of democracy. On Thursday, the shop was full of customers despite the controversy, many taking snapshots of the statue and writing messages of support on the store's makeshift Lennon wall. And when one family was asked why they stepped inside, Five-year-old Jessica answered, And her mum says, It can bring the message to our children, or even adults, and let them know that the freedom of speech and democracy are important core values in Hong Kong. The protests that started a year ago have evolved into pro-democracy demonstrations and have generated widespread enthusiastic support, as well as staunch opposition in the Chinese-ruled city. And there is growing concern businesses are coming under pressure to distance themselves from the movement. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says Europe is now facing the choice between freedom and tyranny when it comes to its relationship with the Chinese regime. His comments come as part of the Copenhagen Democracy Summit. Speaking at the Copenhagen Democracy Summit, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo addressed the idea that the U.S. is asking Europe to choose between it and China which he says is simply not the case. It's the Chinese Communist Party that's forcing this choice. The choice is between the United States, it's between freedom and tyranny. He said that 30 years ago, spurred on by the rising tide of democracy in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, Western countries believed they could change the Chinese Communist Party. They thought the spread of freedom was inevitable. But he described how the Chinese regime instead took advantage of the West's goodwill and is now deeply intertwined with the U.S. and Europe. Pompeo explained that democracy isn't fragile in the way that the CCP believes it is. It's authoritarian regimes that are fragile, while democracies are strong. There's nothing brave or visionary about oppressing your fellow men or women. Democracy is the only system of government that honors human dignity and personal freedom and progress for mankind. According to Pompeo, there's no clear American or European way to face the choice, but it's not possible to be dependent on authoritarians without compromising democratic values. Chinese prosecutors say they've charged two detained Canadians for alleged espionage in a case that has driven a diplomatic wedge between Ottawa and Beijing. Two Canadians detained by Chinese authorities were charged on Friday with espionage by prosecutors. Former diplomat Michael Kovrig and businessman Michael Spavor were arrested in late 2018 on state security charges that have strained diplomatic relations between the two countries. They were first arrested shortly after Canadian authorities arrested Huawei Chief Financial Officer Meg Wang Zhu in Vancouver on a US warrant. China's calls for her release have gone unanswered and subsequently has warned Canada of consequences for aiding the United States in Meng's case. While China maintains the detentions are not linked to Meng, former diplomats and experts have said they are being used to pressure Canada. Charging the two Canadians represents the next step in judicial proceedings against Kovrig and Spavor and means a formal trial can now begin.
The charges against the pair include spying on sensitive national secrets. Kovrig works for the International Crisis Group. They've previously said that the accusations against him are vague and unsubstantiated. In a sign of the economic hardship across the country, over 100 million Americans have deferred loan payments since the lockdowns. Many are now taking advantage of the hardship programs to get some respite. There's over 100 million Americans enrolled in debt relief programs to either postpone or reduce their loan payments. People with student loans are getting the most help. There are over 80 million students signed up. There were only 18 million last month. The number of people getting help on car loans has doubled to over 7 million. Personal loans also doubled to 1.3 million. As part of the government stimulus plan, federal student loans can be deferred until the end of September without penalty. If it's a government-backed mortgage, homeowners should be able to defer payments by up to 12 months. But there's much uncertainty. Some homeowners are having trouble contacting their bank. Because of CCP virus lockdowns, most call centers are closed. Call wait times can be anywhere from three to four hours. And the call volume has increased sixfold compared to March. Governor Gavin Newsom is ordering all Californians to wear masks at nearly all times outside the home. The new mandate is one of the broadest of any state. Children aged two years old and under and people with disabilities are exempt. California on Thursday ordered locals to wear masks at nearly all times outside the home. The new mandate is one of the broadest of any U.S. state. Exceptions will be made for people eating in restaurants or exercising outdoors so long as they maintain six feet of physical distance. According to officials, state or local authorities would be able to charge Californians who don't wear a mask with a misdemeanor. Governor Gavin Newsom said the strict new rule was necessary because, quote, we are seeing too many people with faces uncovered, putting at risk the real progress we have made. However, Newsom did not say how the state planned to enforce the order, which even recommends masks for people driving alone in their cars. But most U.S. states have less strict mask guidelines, and some have none, including Montana and South Carolina. A robot technology is introduced to help people to enjoy golf during the crisis in a safer way. Several golf courses in the New York City area are using robot caddies to help golfers keep their social distance. A robot technology is introduced to help people to enjoy golf during the crisis in a safer way. Several golf courses in the New York City area are using robot caddies to help golfers to keep their social distance. At Suburban Golf Club in Union, New Jersey, four robot caddies costing $4,000 each were introduced as a new option for golfers who prefer walking alone without carrying the bag. They're powered by a lithium battery that lasts two rounds of 18 holes before needing to be recharged. So they don't have to carry their bag or use a pull cart. So they can also store drinks on it, uh, divot mix, it's got a phone charger. Uh, it's, it's great. I mean, it handles and holds pretty much anything you need it to hold. The autonomous vehicles are controlled using a remote that clips to the golfer's belt and follow between 4 and 10 feet behind the golfer. One of the club's golfers who regularly uses a robot caddy is attorney Richard Court. He doesn't like to pay for a human caddy due to cost and doesn't want to carry or push his clubs. I love it because it actually makes you feel like a pro golfer. You're just walking along, you can look at the hole, decide what club you want to use, figure out what your shot should look like and where the ball should be. Um, it's almost like, like you have a real caddy. Yet yeah. the robot <laughs> is unable to offer advice or companionship. So some golfers like Marco Salermo prefers a human caddy. I love technology, but I still like taking the, the actual caddy out. You know, but we interact out there, he gives me advice and I enjoy that. Caddy Michael Walsh said he isn't worried about losing his job, at least for now. But he did wonder about when technology develops in the future, whether robots may come to replace more human jobs like his own. A cluster of virus infections has broken out inside one of Germany's biggest meat processing factories. The surge has become too much for local forces to handle, so they're now bringing in the army. More than 700 workers tested positive for the virus in Germany's latest outbreak. Located inside one of the country's biggest meat processing plants, the cluster size almost doubled in just two days. 
The explosion of cases has proved too much for the local officials, so they've asked for higher level support. I asked for help from the Army and they arrived this morning. I also asked for help from the federal and state government because it's clear that we can't manage this on our own anymore. About 5,000 people are to be tested as fast as possible, but safety measures had to be set in place to avoid further spread of infections. We are testing the workers on the factory site and the soldiers are wearing full protective gear. The county decided to close all schools and kindergartens again to halt the outbreak. Most parents are not happy about that decision. They rely on schools and kindergartens to go to work. I totally understand the bad mood among parents. I have four children myself and I know that I threw over well-laid plans. He added that the step had to be taken as citizens' health is his top priority right now. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to like and subscribe for the latest updates and see you next time.